Now we turn to our uh, speaker to talk on the Australian research policy context. Kelly Johnson, Professor, Director of the Social Policy Research Centre at the University of New South Wales. Professor Johnson is a world-renowned research, social researcher, writer and thinker on issues of policy and practice for people with disability and carers. She's currently the director of the SPIC, Social Policy Research Centre, and before that she was professor of uh, disability policy and practice and director of the Nora Fry Research Centre at the University of Bristol in the UK. Uh, currently she's leading a team including Myra Hamilton, Rosemary KS and Gianfranco Jeanette Giontoli in a major Australian research project called, the Transi called Transitioning Respite, about which I think we're going to hear. So please welcome uh, Professor Kelly Johnson. Thank you. Thank you very much. This has been a most interesting day. Um, and it's always a little anxiety creating being the last act, particularly when the previous ones have been so good. So what I'm going to do today is to talk with you about some work that we're doing actually with National Respite um, around trying to work our way through the transition process that you're all going through and that's been the major topic of conversation today. But I'll also draw on some of the experiences I had in the UK. As you can tell from my accent, I'm not English. I'm Australian, honest. I come from Melbourne originally, so I'm still finding my way around Sydney. Um, but I have had quite a lot of experience in working overseas, particularly with people with disabilities. I think today has thrown up for me a lot of sort of tensions that feel like they're under the surface a bit. Some of them kind of bubble right to the top, others sort of sit underneath. So what I'm going to do is sort of raise those as I, as I go along. I want to leave some time for questions and I've also set up with Chris very kindly an opportunity for people to just come and talk afterwards because I'm very keen for people to give some input into the work that we're doing. Okay, so... Whoops. So the aims of the paper. Well, to consider the current situation of change and transition that everyone's going through and to outline changes in Australian policy that affect respite care for people with disabilities, for older people and their carers. And to describe what National Respite is doing to support this transition process. To describe what we can learn from overseas experience and to outline a framework for understanding changes to respite care. And I'll talk more about that as I go on. So change and transition. We've been talking about it all day. They're not the same thing. And I think one of the things that I've become very aware of is that currently there are changes in policy in relation to older people and people with disabilities. Um, and change itself can be difficult. So the changes in policy sit there and they can lead to a feeling of loss of power. We no longer know what we're doing, which seems to be a view from some people. Um, that we've got to take on new learning and that there's a degree of uncertainty in the whole process. Now the policy changes that have happened have happened, you're part of them, but you're now experiencing what it means in practice, which is really the transition stage. And as you can see from my cartoon, you might agree with the policies and most people seem to, but the transition itself can be very difficult. So looking at transition, it means ending or changing what was quite drastically. There's sort of a neutral time, which feels a bit like everyone's in at the moment, where you're sort of struggling with new creative options that you're developing, but also feeling slightly uncertain about what on earth's going on and which way you should go. And then there are new beginnings, which are also, I think, starting to happen. And I've started off with this slide because it seems to me that we really need to come to some sort of understanding of the process that we're all going through at the moment. So I want to set a little bit of context. I've worked with people with disabilities, a lot with people with intellectual disability, for about 20 years. And I've watched huge changes happen. And when Bruce said today that this is the Snowy Mountain Scheme, 
of um, change, I could really identify with that because it does feel like it's a culmination in moving from people being treated very much as objects or as patients who needed a lot of care in institutions, and I was part of that movement of people into the community, to citizens with rights. And I think that's, it's important to keep that sort of in focus. This is part of a much bigger discourse that's been going on now for about 30 years. In Australia, it feels like this has been, an, this recent change is an enormous one, and I think it is, but it is part of something that is bigger. And I think it's also there for people, for older people as well. So we've got a movement towards personalisation from people being on the fringes and in the institution where I worked, people were managed in groups to people now being seen much more as individuals with needs, with options, with possibilities of living good lives in the community. And it's a very big change, I think. So the NDIS, which is sort of the culmination of that, offers a lifelong package. It, it has a focus on people with disabilities, which, as I've mentioned, is part of that bigger discourse. Along with that comes individualised budgets, which is part of that, that issue about people taking more power in their lives. I've got very wary of, those, of that phrase, choice and control, because I'm not sure how much that actually works in practice. And I think we throw it glibly around without unpacking it. But certainly there is a view that people should have more power in their lives. And the NDIS is, is probably the culmination of that for people here. The NDIS refers to people under 65. So it offers something for those groups. I think that raises a whole stack of issues in terms of care of people who um, might be over 65 who have disabilities. But that's something else to talk about. It doesn't apply to all people with disability. So Bruce this morning talked about Tier 3 and Tier 2. And I've got to say to you that I feel somewhat anxious about the people who don't make it up to those steps. It's ironic, isn't it? That in a way, in order to get the services, you've got to prove how disabled you are, while at the same time people are saying, we want you to be citizens with rights and have to have power in your life. There does seem to be a slightly odd thing there operating. So I worry about the groups who may not find themselves in the NDIS. And I worry about that partly out of my experience in the UK, where the situation was slightly different. Although there were individualised budgets, a strong emphasis on personalisation, but with economic constraints, um, people were more forcefully assessed. And a lot of people found themselves reconstructed as people without disabilities. They hadn't changed, their needs were the same, but suddenly they were not part of that group. So they lost things like their bus concessions, they, they were moved on to unemployment benefits. There were a whole set of things which happened. And it also led to a marginalisation. And I'm not saying that because I think that's what will happen here, but I think it is something to be wary of. And when you're not sure what's going to happen for those groups, that is something to think about. There's little emphasis in the NDIS on care and needs, and I don't need to go into detail about that. You all are living it. And so I think I don't want to go into detail, although I'm happy to do so later. But because of that focus on the individual with disabilities, it is almost inevitable that another group is going to be pushed sideways. And that too is part of a bigger discourse. I think for many people with disabilities over the years, this, the sense of being constantly cared for, of being often devalued, of being treated as if you are a burden that other people have got to look after, is very strongly felt. People with disabilities who have physical disabilities are very articulate about that. It's much harder for people with dis intellectual disabilities, I think, to often say how they feel in that situation. But I think one of the issues is that 
we've got to balance some way. In the past, respite was about carers. Now suddenly it seems to be switching to, it's all about people with disabilities. And yet we work in partnership. You know, people with disabilities and carers work together. We have to, their relationships are there. Um, so somehow we've got to find a balance, to keep a balance between a focus on the person with disability or the older person and the carer and not let one go or the other. I am somewhat, I must say, sympathetic to a change in name because I do think respite care carries that history for a lot of people with disabilities, a history they want to leave behind them. I don't know. It may be, I noticed there weren't terribly many people who wanted to change in name today, but it might be worth just thinking about that. I was thinking over lunch that, you know, if I... In a, in a relationship, if my partner said to me, well, I need respite care for a couple of days from you, I'm not quite sure how I'd actually feel about that. Being told that I need a short break by the beach might be quite a different way of putting it. Um, and I think there, there is a lot in a name and something to think about. One of the issues in Australia that is different to the UK is that there's no separate carer assessment. And I don't know what I feel about that. The research that we've been doing, the reading that we've been doing, suggests that it can become very complicated when you've got a separate carer assessment and a, an assessment for the person with disabilities or the older person. Because then you've got to try and find ways of balancing those two sets of needs. One move in Canada was to look at family needs rather than to focus on the carer and the person with a disability. So that you, you're sort of looking at a family or a group as a unit. Now, I'm not sure about that, but I think there are things that we need to think about with this. Um, and I do worry if carers sort of drop off the list. I guess the changes are there for older people as well. And I think that one of the complications for everyone is that it's all happening together. So not only is there the NDIS, there is also um, the Commonwealth Home Support Program, which also has implications for respite care. Now that will provide basic support for older people and for carers. It's focused on community living and people being able to live their lives in the community rather than in nursing homes or in, in other residential care. There's a focus again on the older person's individual goals and preferences. And I think, you know, you can sort of see it's the same, it's the same philosophy that is driving both of, both of these emphases. It has Commonwealth funding and it has incorporated a lot of other programs within it, including national respite care. Now only carers of people over 65 will be eligible for this program. And again, there appears to be no separate assessment of carers' needs. And what I will say to you is if you feel like breaking in, please do. I sort of feel like I'm giving a lecture and I don't really want to do that. Okay, so again, there is this focus, renewed focus on the individual or the participant or the person with disabilities or the older person and the carer is, is taking somewhat lesser place. So, to the project that we're involved in. Now, I think, I think actually, if you haven't signed up for National Respite, you probably should, and that's not just because we've got a tender with them. Because I think they've, they've developed a project which they've asked us to do, which is trying to make sense of this transition process of this time of sort of creativity, but also muddle, where it's hard letting go of the past and difficult to do it because of um, e economic and political entanglements, not to mention relationships, and to look at what might be new beginnings and new options for respite care. So we are currently involved in a project with National Respite, which started in July and will go through until next year. And the aim of that project is to improve understanding of the possible impact of policy changes for four groups of stakeholders, participants, carers,
communities and government? Big ask. Um, makes me shiver sometimes, but we're into it. Um, so we've been going really since July. So we're not, we're not through our investigation. You should see this as a work in progress. So there are three phases to this program or to this piece of work. One is to undertake a literature review of Australian and international policy contexts in order to understand better what transition to consumer-directed care might mean for, for respite care particularly. And to establish a framework in which we can describe better what respite care does, what its goals are, what its outputs are, and what the outcomes are for people. So I'll be drawing on that literature in order to do that, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And later, which we haven't got to yet, and you might want to have some input into, is to develop some hypothetical transition scenarios. So what might be the new beginnings? How can we think of respite care in the context of the NDIS and the Commonwealth package? What can we start to think about that's different? And floating around today, there have been so many ideas raised by people. Um, I'm hoping that you'll want to give us some input into some of the ideas that you've got. So what can be learned? Oh, I've left out the most important part of the research. What we've been doing is talking with you, with groups, with a group of people who are involved in leading respite care services. And it's been extremely important to do that. And some of the things that, I think some of the things that we've learned have both confirmed some of the research findings from overseas, but have also thrown up particular issues that people are confronting now. I think one of the issues that's been thrown up, one of the tensions, I've mentioned the first one, there's carers and there's people with participants. Another one I think is you're caught up in a, an issue around um, a totally different way of funding. And that goes along with a different focus on people with disabilities and older people. And it seems to me, as I've listened to people, um, including Bruce this morning, the economic terms are rolling off people's lips, you know? We've sort of got it, products, we've got, I don't know, what are the others? Quickly, somebody, give me a yell. Consumers, yeah, markets, markets are everywhere. Branding, how are we going to rebrand ourselves? What kind of ways can we fit? And at a meeting yesterday with some of the people who are involved in respite care, I raised the issue that there's a tension there between what people saw themselves as doing when they got involved in respite care and what they're now being asked to do, which is a, a different way of working altogether. And again, I think we've got to have a balance there somehow between the economic drive that's sitting there really strongly, because you won't survive if you don't match it, and the, the sort of, I'm trying to think of the words, it's not a service, it's more a concern with people. The, most people I suspect have come into respite care or into, into working with people with disabilities or older people because they want change to happen and they want to work with people. And that somehow finding a balance between those and working out the best way forward is I think a tension that sits there for a lot of us. And it was certainly sitting there for someone yesterday when I said, well, you know, what about these products? And is this the sort of word that we're going to use? And someone in the group said, well, we use the words because we've got to, but we still feel underneath words to that effect. And I think that, that that kind of tension there is quite difficult to resolve. So what we've done so far is to begin a literature search, a literature review. Um, and I think I'm not going to talk very much specifically about some of the English research, and there's quite a lot of it, because Karen Jones, who's the keynote tomorrow morning, will do that in more detail. So services are changing. So what can we learn? The shift to personalisation and the move in aged care services 
has led to changes in the way services are funded. So in England, in some states in America, in Canada, there's been a movement in a lot of countries from block funding to individualised funding for services. It can lead to a shift in the way services are provided, and I want to talk a bit more about that. I'm just raising some general points here. So a shift from the way respite, I think, was often seen by the people I worked with when I worked in Australia, from being, I've, I'm going to, into respite, and that meant I went to a house somewhere for a few days while people had a rest, to a much more diverse, much more exciting ways of working. And some of those, I think, were, have been raised today. And it raises the question again of who benefits, participant, carer, or both? It's very interesting that a lot of the research we've looked at has got a carer's perspective to it. And I'm not sure whether that's because it's, it's not absolutely up to date um, or whether care, it's been easier to do research with carers. But certainly, for a lot of the literature we read, it was quite hard to find how participants saw respite care. In a lot of the research, there's a focus on the outcomes for both the carer and for the participant. And those outcomes have been very much focused on well-being, psychological well-being, physical well-being, social, environment, and economic well-being. And I want to come back to those when I start looking at the framework that we've developed. But what are you saying about the changes? And this, this slide is a, um, a result of discussions with people who are probably in this audience, I think. Generally, people were su supportive of the philosophy that, that of personalisation and of consumer-directed care. There's a feeling that it's a good idea to do it. But anxieties are there in plenty about what these mean for the people who work in this field. So there were concerns about casualisation of a workforce, a lack of security in employment, difficulties in providing um, training for people. They're all issues that are much broader than, I think, respite care, but certainly this has been the focus of discussion with some of the people that we've talked with. Also anxiety that some people are going to set up very small businesses of their own and do their own respite care. And where will that leave other organisations which do provide training and support for their staff? There's uncertainty about the effects of this change, both, on, both for, well, for participants, for carers, and for the staff who work in this field and uncertainty about funding, which I think has arisen over and over today. So what will happen for the groups of people who don't make it into tier three or the upper part of tier two? How will, how will services be provided for that group? What does, what does funding mean for the services that are there? Will there still be some block funding? And talking to Chris just before, he said that you know there are differences across states in how that's being managed. The changing terminology and language. So there's both the economic speak and there is, are we using the right terms when we're talking about people and our services? And I think, you know, respite care has been around for a long time. Um, and it has a hi proud history in terms of what it's managed to do for carers and for people with disabilities and older people. Letting go of that language is, I think, quite difficult. There's a concern for families from many of the people that we've spoken to, that what will happen if the focus is solely on the participant and doesn't include the carer? How will this work for families? There's a worry about increased workload, of managing extra forms and finances, and families having to take on more responsibilities. One of the articles that we picked up in our literature review said that some services were actually making money to um, keep their services going by becoming consultants in terms of managing the financial issues 
out of consumer-directed care. I don't know if anyone's thought of that approach, but certainly that seemed to be something that was developing in some countries. The move to a business model and the quick learning that needs to happen, because you haven't got a couple of years to do an MBA before you're thrust into it. And the importance of training and education for people who work with people with disabilities and older people. And a real worry about a loss of skilled staff. Does anyone want to raise anything while I'm raging on here? No? Okay, so what we've done is to develop a framework which we hope will, um, I'll just a minute, I'll find my piece of paper here, which we hope will allow us to look at the sort of, the way in which services might go and to provide some clarity about the issues around transition. And what we've done with that is to try and abstract it. So we haven't separated out respite for older people and respite for people with disabilities. We've used the literature that we've read around both areas to try and pull together what seem to be the main issues, both as outputs and outcomes. So this framework is informed by literature and consultation. And after this session, I'm keenly interested in talking with people who'd like to add to it, change it, do something else with it, because we're in the process of developing at the moment. The framework will provide a basis for exploring scenarios of transition. Now, what we did was go back through the literature, look at the findings from it, which are often sort of smaller things, and we've tried to build them up into a sets of clusters of outcomes and outputs. So I'll just go back to what outputs are. Outputs are the products, services or facilities that result from an organisation's activities. And the outcomes are the changes or benefits or learning or other effects that are there for people who are engaged with the organisation. So let's start off by having a look at outputs. So the first of the outputs that we looked at was the location of respite. In home, we looked at, there are a lot of different types of respite care, as you all know. Um, and some, are, are not many, have I not heard today that I read in the literature. So there was a pretty broad coverage of the sort of location of respite. So it's in home, it's centre base. The in home respite seems from the literature to be much more short term to be something that's there for an evening or for a few hours. Centre-based, which is often a day centre to which someone might go for one day or go regularly. A host family, which I think we had a very good discussion about earlier this afternoon. And community, therapeutic or health-based location. So it could be somewhere in the community that people go with someone else in terms of respite care, or it could be, and that could be for a day or for half a day. If there are more serious issues, then therapeutic or health-based care is a possibility for respite. And I know that for some people, because I've heard people talk about it, respite, particularly emergency respite, often ends up in that category where you've just got to find a somewhere for someone to go at five o'clock on Friday afternoon when there's absolutely nothing that you can think of. And I worked with a student in Melbourne who was a social worker and had to go and collect a little girl who'd been left by her family at a hospital. Um, they just couldn't manage anymore and that was the only place that she could be left for about four or five days. I don't know how common that is. Is it very common for people here, that kind of and I think it's interesting that that kind of emergency respite isn't, it doesn't seem to be getting a lot of discussion at the moment. And yet it does seem to me that that's one of the things that really does need to be thought about very seriously. 
about how that will how that will play out in a different world. The quantity and the timing of respite is a second output. So the number of hours that people can have when that's costed, or the number of hours that they need, the time of day or week, and whether it's available at short notice and whether it's flexible. The activities that people have, therapeutic, social, recreational, family-based activities and personal care. Okay, so that's, that's oh, the, re the reach is participants under 65, for people with disabilities, people over 65, for older people, carers of people under 65, carers of people over 65. Someone this morning said to me that she was very concerned about people who might have early onset dementia, who would come in under 65, but where people working with people with disabilities may not have much in the way of experience or skills in, in sort of working with that group of people. Now I'm going to just stop and say very quickly, what have we missed out of your outputs? I'll talk about outcomes in a minute. Yeah. Oh yes, yeah, sorry, I should have done that. Yeah, that includes that. So it can, and it can be cottage, cottage respite where you stay overnight um, or for a few days. And the centre-based one can be a day, day centre, yes. All of these are, are in the literature. They're described in the literature. We haven't found any other models, but there might be some out here. Yes. Oh, I've got five minutes, crikey. Ten, okay. It's a really good point. Yep, transport, and that got raised a lot this morning, I know, because it's, it's going to have an effect um, on the amount of time people can spend with people, as I understand it. Thank you for that. Is there anything else? Holidays. Holidays, yep. Okay. Yeah. So that would be covered, wouldn't it, in terms of if someone comes in for a short period of time and and stays with the person. Yeah. Okay, so let me go on to have a look at the outcomes, which is where um, a lot of the issues are, I think. The outcomes, if you remember, are those things which affect um, carers, um, participants and the community. And what we did was to break them up into a series of groups. And what we found, and I think, you know, as respite people, you should feel very good because a lot of the research is extremely positive about the effects of respite for carers and for people with disabilities and for older people. Individual health and well-being, we found in um, it improved carers' emotional well-being. They saw it as a break when they could be just less stressed because of care. They might experience less anxiety about the person they're caring for. Um, that, they, that it gave them a chance to be without responsibility for a time. Improving physical activities has been shown in the literature to be there for both carers and for people participants, um, an opportunity to get out and about, to go for walks, to meet other people as you do that, opportunities for some self-care. For people, for participants, there were issues about feeling more relaxed, having a break from the person who is your carer, because sometimes it's a very intense relationship, was also a very positive thing for people. Opportunities too for making connections. There were really lovely stories told earlier today about young people with disabilities who had created links with families, other families. 
that was for them and it was also an opportunity for carers to have relationships with other people, to have an opportunity to build friendships to create new ones. So it offers also a chance for enhanced freedom or choice. So you can actually just decide what it is that you want to do. And I would think if the respite care is focused on the participant, there would be opportunities for them to have that as well as the carer. For people with um, disabilities and older people, some of the literature suggests that um, they see respite care as a movement to more independence, an opportunity to build relationships on their own terms. So, individual health and well-being is well documented in the literature for both carers and participants, though less so for participants, because there hasn't been as much research done. Social and economic participation included creating opportunities for participation in recreational activities, and that was certainly there for both carers and for participants. A sense of reducing social isolation that's sometimes felt by participants and also by carers was seen as very important in the research. And managing but not acquiring work. So the research that we, research literature says that, as you commented, it's easier to manage an educational program that you might want to be involved in with good respite. And if you are working, it is easier to manage the work. But there is no evidence really, no significant evidence that people are able to find work in as a result of having a sort of good respite care service. Maintaining links into the community is seen as very important. So being able to go to the pub or down shopping for both parties was seen as important. And you know, one of the interesting things is, isn't it, that you know, always we've thought about respite care as a break for the carers. It hasn't been much thought about whether the participant wants a break from the person who's caring for them. But I suspect quite a few of them do. And that's certainly shown up in the literature. Personal relationships. Respite offers a chance to strengthen family relationships and also to strengthen the relationship between carer and the person who's being cared for. Having that break allows people to come back together again with perhaps a different view of the relationship or with more energy and strength in, in developing it. It also gave carers a chance to strengthen family relationships and to have time with other members of their family. And it provided opportunities to spend time with friends. And that, again, all of these are outcomes which are there for both the carer and, although less well documented, for participants. Workforce capacity and conditions, there's very little research out there about workers, at least that we've managed to discover. And I think that's actually an area that we should be doing some work in. We should be finding out more about how you see your jobs, what the issues are for you, and what might be done about it. But issues around having employment, having secure employment with opportunities for training and education, may be some of the things that are valued outcomes for workers, as well as a sense of doing a job that is really needed and worthwhile. Community cap capacity and support, the issues around social capital. It is important in the community that we can foster community activities and people getting out, people with disabilities and older people getting out into the community is one of the ways that we can do that. Look, I've worked, with, as I said, with people for a long time and one of the things that's always worried me is that in all our movements for people to have better lives in the community, we haven't done much that will look at how the community might change so that they can lead those better lives. And I think respite care can assist that, um, both through some of the ways that it's done, but also in people being more part outside of a family 
relationship. Okay, and I didn't think of um, volunteers in terms of workforce, but that was made very strongly today. Yep. Yep. Yeah, no, that's that's a good point. That's a good point, I think. And I think, you know, there are also hidden groups of participants too, um, which I'm sure some of you have got some ideas about. But, you know, I, I mean, I worked with people in England who identified as coming from Chinese communities and were living in England. And their take up of services, respite services or any other, was very low compared to other groups in the community. And I think that's probably true in Australia as well. Because we we haven't, but we perhaps should do that. Yeah, well, I think that that's a good example of a group that perhaps doesn't take up yep. services as much as others, but when you consider the number of people that Yeah, I was, I was talking to someone from an Indigenous service today who was saying that they felt like they'd been, they hadn't been sufficiently consulted with the changes that were happening. And, you know, Chris, maybe we can build that into what we're doing. Um, I think it's an important... And there are also huge cultural issues there too, both for people from um, different cultural backgrounds and for Indigenous people in Australia. Any other comments? I'm going to come to a close in a minute. Oh, one of the things, you can't go away feeling too good about yourselves. Some of the literature does say that there can be negative outcomes from respite care. Um, some carers feel a good deal of guilt and anxiety about using respite care. It's probably in a micro fashion, but when I was doing work on deinstitutionalisation, Families had carried guilt for 20 years about the fact that their son or daughter had had to go to an institution. And my suspicion is that when somebody goes away from home to respite, there is, for some carers, that same sense of guilt and anxiety about it. Sorry? Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think it's, it was also interesting, though, because those families were also saying we couldn't do anything else, we needed space and time, we couldn't manage any longer. So, you know, it's sort of, it's a very ambivalent um, response, I think, and very, very difficult for people, particularly if the institution closes and they're suddenly being told they did the wrong thing. Um, I think for participants, the research suggests that sometimes, and there's not much on this, and there should be, sometimes participants feel alone, uncertain. I was thinking particularly of my mum who had Alzheimer's, dreadfully uncertain and frightened when she was away from her own place. So moving people out of home can be quite traumatic for them. The research suggests that when this is really, really a big, when these issues are really big for carers and for participants, it may relate more to the way in which it's managed and the kind of respite care that's being offered. So it's sort of a, a reflection on practice there that needs to happen. Okay. I'm going to stop there, except I just want to reiterate a couple of things. I think in the next day of your conference and in the work that you do, as you move through this time of muddle and confusion and new beginnings and exciting creativity options, creative options, thinking about some of the tensions that you are managing may be useful. So the tensions around the person with disabilities or the older person and carer. The tension between the economic drive, which is everywhere and part of a huge, I think, global discourse now, the tension between that economic drive and how you maintain the sort of way in which you work with people or develop it further 
uh, is another important tension. And I think it would be good if, that, if, if those sort of tensions can be brought out more and thought about more and unpacked. I'm going to stop there and see if there are any questions. Now we do have to move out of this room by 5.30 so it can be set up for our fabulous dinner tonight. But let's take a couple of moments for some questions from the floor. Um, and remember also that uh, there will be this additional session upstairs in the Avalon room. Thank you. Um, for another hour after this. So that's really great. Okay, first question, So, Sorry, this is not a question directed at you, but somebody put their hand up and said holiday. Are you referring to the the person with the disability or the carer? That's, or both. that's the question I wanted because I just yeah. I'm curious about that. It's the person who said holiday here. Yep. yep. Do you want to answer that? Um, either or. Yes. Within our service, we have um, participants who get great benefits from going on holidays, whether they're supported with a carer or with a group of yep. participants and carer. Um, camps especially, um, but I find that some families, if they have the opportunity to have a holiday each year, even something fairly simple, that's enough for them to keep going, mm. knowing that something's going to happen that gives them a break and allows them to continue in their role. Yeah. So either or. Okay. Well, sometimes both maybe, yeah. you know. really hard to see up here. Yes. Yeah, I'd just like to add to that comment because we, our service also offers a holiday, a respite break, call it what you like, um, for uh, participants, for carers or family groups. And it's my deep belief that people who are supporting someone with their mental health person with psychosocial disability or child or that Families need to have the same sorts of experiences and memories mm. that everybody else in this community has access to. And I've always struggled with the issue that often it's very difficult to get funding bodies to believe that holidays can be just a, a valid service mm. type. Yeah. There is an issue, isn't there? I mean, I think when we think about holidays, um, I mean, my memories of... Um, probably a while ago now, a sort of a group of people with intellectual disabilities being put in a bus and taken off for a holiday by the beach, you know? And I, I sort of, I, I'm conscious that things, I hope, have really changed. But I do wonder with individualised funding, how can you keep that focus on the individual and make sure that it doesn't retreat back into a, well, we'll all go together in the bus type holiday. I think we have time for two more questions. One from here. I actually just wanted to make a comment that I th thought it was really refreshing to hear you talk about respite from the perspective of thinking about the participant coming into it. I used to work, I mean I know that carers really, really need the break, but I actually used to see the participant coming into respite as a break for them mm. and an opportunity for them to find out things about themselves and to explore things that they want to explore that they might not get the opportunity to explore. Mm in their everyday environment. And I think that's just going to be a fantastic focus to take into the future. Hope so. That, I think that's great too. I mean, any opportunity that gives people a, a chance to live more, more closely into their communities, I think, is to be applauded. But I do think that, you know, I, I personally, I think short breaks are a better way of, of summarising what you all do than respite care is, myself. Um, because I think that covers both, both partners in the relationship, both the participant and the person and the carer. Um, and it, it gives equal weight to each, but, you know. I just, I just wanted to quickly add to my earlier point about the holidays is about new experiences that they may not get in another way, but also that leading into then possibility of employment and then pathways for their life which is just incredible to see happen. You see, you've all got to get better at documenting what you do. Um, you know, you're a sort of slightly hidden group. Um, and it'd be a pity if it's only in the crisis periods that you, you get the sort of 
heard voice that you probably need. I think we could be um, sitting here talking about these issues till nine o'clock tonight, but we have one final question from the back of the room. Hi. Um, I just wanted to... Um, I just want to know whether the individual health and well-being, uh, your first point there, also uh, whether you were including that um, that respite care is often used in order to take a person along to a medical appointment because they have behavioural issues. So I call it appointment care, appointment care rather than actual respite care because it's certainly not respite for no. the carer. It's so it's to enable an appointment to go on if the person with the disability has a meltdown, they can go and sit in the cafe or something. Okay. And, and that's where a lot of respite gets used up. Appointments, appointments, appointments with ADAC, appointments with schools, appointments with health services. Look, thank you for raising that. That's really important. And as I said, I think in today's discussion, some of that and the sort of emergency respite care hasn't kind of floated for me to the surface very much. So thank you very much for that. And you know, if people want to help us put this framework together, um, please do come and have a chat with me upstairs. Great. Thanks very much, Kelly.